Hi, stage three. I'm going to read to us the next chapter of Valley of Gold by Jackie French. Um, but at, as I read it, we're going to also be focusing on another one of the skills that good readers have. We've looked at the idea of them visualising, making pictures in their mind about what they're reading. But today we're going to shift our focus to good readers' question as they read. And we're going to do that by me starting off by doing a think aloud. And what a think aloud is, is as I read, I'm going to pause along the way and show you what kind of thoughts I'm having through my head and the questions that I'm forming as I read. Now, obviously, good readers don't do this out loud. Uh, I'm doing it out loud to be able to model and show to you what is actually going on in my mind. So I'm going to do that for the first part of this chapter. But then I'm going to pause and I'm going to ask you to do that. So you're going to need to have a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil near you um, because when I flip over and ask you to take charge of the questioning, we're going to ask you to write down the questions that you have as I read the text. Now, ordinarily, good readers wouldn't stop and write it down. They would just do it inside their mind. But uh, we're wanting to learn this skill. And so we need to slow the process down write down those questions that you have uh, to show us that you are forming questions as I'm reading uh, because we know that this is a skill that makes any reader a better reader. So I'm going to start with that right now. We're reading 1853 and the chapter is titled Gold. The vampire flew over her just as the moonlight began to thread through the trees. Now already I have a question. Vampire, I thought we were reading about gold in a particular valley in Australia. I know vampires aren't real. But what I also notice when I'm reading is that there is a little asterisk next, asterisk next to vampire. And if I go to the bottom of the page, there's a little note for me. And it says, Mary Ann's vampire was a greater glider. They like blossom, not blood. So the vampire is a greater glider. I know that a glider, greater glider, is a type of bat. And so when I read the word vampire from Marianne, I'm going to be thinking of bat. I'll start it again. The vampire flew over her just as the moonlight began to thread through the trees. Marianne screamed and pulled the blanket over her face. Mary, love, what is it? Up in the tree, a vampire. The big man sat up. Now, already I have a question. Who is this big man? He pushed the hair out of his eyes and tried to smile, but worry had bitten deep into his face. I'm asking the question in my mind. What's he worried about? Sure, love, there are no vampires here. Your Uncle James would have writ us if there'd been vampires. Now, he said writ because he's possibly uneducated and doesn't know that he should say had written to us. Mary Ann peered out from under the blanket. But there was. I saw it. It, ah, there it is. Shoot it, Papa, before it sucks our blood. And here I have an answer to my first question. Papa. So the big man is obviously her father. Her father peered up into the trees just as the vampire launched itself off another branch and glided down to the next tree. He shook his head. That's no vampire, love. But it flies, and it looked down at me, and birds fly, darling. And vampires don't have furry faces, do they? It's some sort of possum, I reckon. And I'm sitting here thinking, possum? I'm not sure if it's a possum. A possum that flies or glides more like. Shh, you settle down now. There's nothing out there that can harm you. Her father pushed his blanket off and poked at the fire so the sparks shot up into the night, then threw on more dead branches. At this point, I'm thinking, hang on a second, she's not sleeping inside, she's sleeping outside next to a fire. What's going on? Why are they outside? The trees in this strange land were always dropping branches, thought Mary Ann, as though they didn't want them anymore. Strange land. Why is this a strange land to Mary Ann? Maybe she's travelled from far away uh, and because it's a valley of gold, maybe she's come for the gold rush. I don't know that yet. But at least it made it easy to collect wood for the fire. See, said her father, a nice bright fire to keep the vampires away. Can you sleep now? 
No, said Marianne honestly. How about I tell you a story then? Her father lowered himself down onto the ground beside her. A story about uh, a princess and her father, hey? Heading to a new land? They travelled by coach and they travelled by ship. Oh, many months across the water when they landed at Sydney Town and bought their horses and their stores and headed out to make their fortune in the bush. So in my mind, I'm thinking, is this their story? Maybe this isn't just a bedtime story. Maybe this is the story of Marianne and her father. His words floated over Marianne. She gazed up at the moon, floating big and yellow between the white branches of the tree. Branches shouldn't be white, thought Marianne. They're like ghost trees. Behind her, the horses shuffled in their hobbles as they tore at the tussocks of grass. Okay, so there's horses here. Why have we got horses here? At least that was a comforting sound, a normal sound, not a horrible, strange sound from this horrible, strange country. So my question here is, so it's normal for her to have horses around and to sleep with horses. So what is going on with her? What is her backstory? And soon her father had made enough money for a farm of their own, her father continued. A magic farm it was, with cows as fat as barrels, and the princess grew fat as butter. And they all lived happily ever after. Her father smiled at her. What do you think of that then? But it hadn't happened like that, thought Mary Ann. And my question is, okay, so if this is their story, what really did happen? That story had nothing about mama dying, a fever on the ship, or the grubs in the ship's biscuit, or the drunks that yelled at them in Sydney town. It didn't have the flies or the brown snakes that lay in wait to bite you, or furry vampires gliding through the trees. So my answer's just been, my answer's just come. Uh, the story, backstory of Mary Ann, sounds like this is, this is what's happened to her. And if the beginning of the story wasn't true, maybe the end wasn't either. Maybe Papa would never make enough money to buy a farm, working for Uncle James in this valley place they were going to. And in my head I'm thinking, who's Uncle James? And even if they did have a farm, it would just be a shack like the bark-roofed huts they had seen on their way here. Not a proper house at all. Even Uncle James's house had a dirt floor and no glass in the windows. And there would be flies, thought Mary Ann sleepily. The clouds of flies that gathered in your nose and eyes. And in my mind, I'm questioning, is, is this really what it was like to live at this time in Australia's history? Sleep now, said Papa. He settled back in his blanket, his head pillowed on the saddle. We should see the valley tomorrow. It's a grand place, James says. And soon he was snoring. So I'm going to pause there. You've seen what I'm doing in my mind as I'm reading. I'm questioning. I'm finding answers to some of my questions. Others, I'm just letting them sit there. So what we'd like you to do now is, as I continue to read, start writing down the questions that you have. Um, like I said, this is not normally what a reader would do. They wouldn't write the questions as they go. But we're wanting to see what's going through your head as we read this story. And so we're going to ask you to write that down now. Marianne shut her eyes and thought of home. Green fields and proper houses and ducks on the pond. She was nearly asleep when she felt hot breath over her face. Have you got a question at this point? Write it down. Papa, she asked sleepily. Red eyes stared down at her. Red eyes and white teeth and Papa, the beast growled at her. It was a dog, a wild dog, a warrigal or dingo. And there's another asterisk at the bottom. The dingoes were probably after the leftovers from Mary Ann at her father's dinner. And there were more of them. Three, four, no more. Papa! The dingo took a step back growling. Another second, thought Mary Ann, and it will leap at my throat. She twisted and grabbed the saddlecloth behind her and flicked it at the dingo. One edge of it caught the animal's nose. It stepped back further, its eyes watchful. Somewhere 
another dingo snarled. What was it doing? Was it eating Papa? Then she'd be alone in this horrible bush and fire. Mrs Hanrahan on the boat had said dingoes were afraid of fire. She scrambled up and grabbed one of the branches from the fire and waved the burning end of it high above her head so sparks flared out around the camp. Shoo! She screamed, shoo! It seemed a silly thing to say, like scaring a kitten from the cream back home. But either her words or the sparks must have scared the dogs. They backed away and now Papa was there too, a flaming branch in his hand as well. Get on with you, he thundered. Back now, back! The dingoes retreated into the darkness, but not far, thought Mary Ann. They were still there among the trees, watching. Papa piled more wood on the fire. The flames shot up. The red light pushed the darkness back, but not far enough, thought Mary Ann. Not nearly far enough. Bring your blanket closer to the fire, said Papa hoarsely. I'll stand watch and keep the fire piled up. They won't come close while it's burning high. Marianne nodded. She didn't ask what would have happened if they'd both been asleep when the dingoes came. There had been a piece in the paper about dingoes the first day they'd landed at Sydney Town. The dingoes ate the heart out of you, the paper said, and your entrails too. The fire crackled as she lay down beside it. She could feel its heat on her face, her papa's breath, and a whinny from Bobby. He must be frightened of the dingoes too. Finally, she slept. Fog misted through the trees when she woke. White fog and white trees and long drops of water on the blue-green leaves that sparkled like diamonds as the sun shone through the mist. He's starting to visualise at the same time. If only there really were diamonds, thought Mary Ann. We could buy our farm now. If only the sunlight were gold, we could slice a slab of it like butter and take it to the bank. Billy's boiling, said Papa cheerfully. Too cheerfully, thought Mary Ann. Why did adults always speak to you like that, pretending everything was wonderful? Mary Ann drank her tea, hot and thick with sugar, but no milk. She hadn't tasted milk since they'd left Sydney town. Papa had made damper in the ashes too. It was heavy as a rock and tasted like one too, even with treacle on it. But she ate it anyway. When we have our kitchen, said Papa, there'll be a big iron stove and you'll make bread as light as your mama did. Then he stopped suddenly. It still too, hurt too much for both of them to think about mama. Papa saddled the horses his, his big Mr Jones and Mary Ann's Bobby, and piled the packs on Sammy. Not far now, he said encouragingly, though Mary Ann wondered if he were encouraging her or himself. We should reach the valley today, and then it's only another day's ride down to James's. Why isn't there a road, Papa? I've told you, darling, there are only three farms in the whole valley. Who would build a road to it? But the track's clear enough, just as James ripped me back home. See the marks on the trees? And there's been cattle this way too. See the droppings? Marianne nodded. It still seemed impossible, that was the word, impossible to head out through the trees where there was no road at all and expect to find a farm at the end of it. It had been over a year since Papa had had a letter from Uncle James. Maybe a snake had bitten him. Maybe he was no longer even in the valley. Maybe they'd walk forever through the trees till the dingoes ate them or the vampires sucked their blood. The fog lifted as the sun rose higher. Above it, the sky blazed blue. Sky had no right to be as blue as that, thought Mary Ann. It needed clouds and softness, and the trees should be a proper deep green with their bark on them neatly, not peeling away in crisp strips on the ground. The soil changed. They were heading downhill now. Bobby's hooves struck sharply against the shale. Quartz gleamed between the tussocks. Then suddenly, through the trees, she saw the valley. It was deep and green, and water glinted gold and silver. And suddenly, she could smell flowers. There was even a rainbow arching from one ridge to the other. It all looked so much like a picture on a calendar that Marianne laughed, and Papa grinned at her, relieved to see her happy. 
Who owns it, Papa? She whispered. The valley? No one yet. It's all wild country except for the three farms. Queen Victoria owns the rest, I suppose. Does she run sheep here? The grass looks so short. Ah, that'd be kangaroos. No, darling. One day, a bit of it will be ours. We'll tame it into a proper farm, just you see. What about the black people? Do they own any of it? Papa laughed. What a thought. Come on, love. Not far to go now. Marianne felt her smile evaporate. Not long till what? Another horrible shanty with flies and hard work. It was steep down the ridge, so steep in places that they had to dismount and lead the horses step by step. It seemed to take forever. The sun had sunk behind the ridge when they finally stopped, though Marianne thought it must only be late afternoon. But it was beautiful. Even she had to admit that. The coarse tussocks of the tableland above had given way to fuzzy grass, so short it looked like the mowers had been here already, sweeping with their scythes. And all through the grass were flowers, more flowers than she had ever seen. Yellow daisies that turned their faces to the sun, and tiny pinks that winked among the green, and funny fat green flowers like tiny balloons. Tall ferns with trunks like trees were scattered among the forest, and there were even proper looking trees, all round and dark with white waxy blooms. Even the horrible gum trees were festooned with flowers, tiny white ones and tiny cream and purple trumpets, and other trees had tiny buds of yellow. Bobby snorted and jerked his head. Heh, he can smell the water, said Papa. Come on, it's just through here. It was a broad lake, with a river flowing into it and trickling out the other end. There were even flowers on the water, water lilies like on the village pond at home. But these were big and white. The lake was edged with sand like yellow lace around a tablecloth and birds sang deep among the trees. Not bad, said Papa grinning. What do you say, darling? Not bad? Marianne nodded. It seemed disloyal to say it was beautiful, the most beautiful place she'd ever seen but not without Mama to see it too. And besides, there were still the dingoes and vampires and giant poisonous snakes. They made camp on the soft grass by the water. It seemed cruel to crush so many flowers with their blankets. No need for a fire yet, said Papa. He looked down the long stretch of lake, turning and twisting between the long-armed trees. You stay here, girl, and have a nap. It was precious little sleep you got last night. I'll take the musket and see if I can get a duck for dinner. Better than salt mutton, eh? You'll be all right here by yourself just for a while. Yes, Papa, said Mary Ann, because after all, there was nothing else to say. And he'd had less sleep even than her. But because he couldn't cry, don't leave me all alone, or even take me home, because there was no home now. Not till Papa made enough money to build them one. It was quiet in the clearing. Mary Ann leant against a tree. It had pale yellow bark, not like the grey white bark of the trees above the valley. And the branches were long and stretched up towards the sky. Mary Ann shut her eyes. If she slept sitting up, surely nothing bad could happen to her. The wild dogs and snakes and vampires would think she was awake. It was a strange sleep. It was almost as though she wasn't asleep at all as if she'd floated on the smell of flowers and water into another world, one that was almost this one, but so much better. There was a water hole like this one, and gum trees too, but there were other trees now, familiar apple trees and pear trees and quinces and mulberries and wooden fences around fields that were green, not brown, and fat cows with big udders and a house. It was a real house made of stone, not mud and bark, with six chimneys and a swing out the front and a child on it, all in white frills. And she was pushing the swing back and forth and back and forth. And somehow she knew that the child was her sister, but she couldn't have a sister. She couldn't. Not now Mama was dead. And they'd never have a house like this. Not in this horrible, strange country. And something bumped her leg. Marianne opened her eyes. A monster blinked up at her. 
and there's another asterisk where with monster down the bottom it says a wombat. Wombat pouches face backwards. A very good design feature if your mum is a burrowing animal and you don't want a bed full of grit and gravel and sand. So the babies can look out of the pouch and graze at the same time as the mother. So I'll go back. Our monster blinked up at her. It was the size of a dog, but its legs were shorter and its thick square body was brown and furry. It had two heads, one at each end of its body. One head blinked at her from tiny slits of eyes, while the other head was eating grass, tearing it up, chomp, chomp, chomp. It was pretty small for a monster, but what normal animal had two heads? The monster's first head blinked again, then bent to eat grass like the other one. If I'm very, very quiet, thought Mary Ann, maybe it'll just eat grass and not eat me. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Suddenly, the smaller head gave a wriggle and the monster broke in two. One big monster and a tiny one that squirmed out between the mother, but be between the big monster's hind legs. A mother monster and a baby one, thought Marianne. The baby must have been in the mother's pouch underneath its body. Mrs Hanrahan had told her animals in this land had pouches, but she hadn't said they looked so silly. She tried not to giggle. The baby looked around, bored. It bounced at a shadow, then looked round for something else to do. Bang! The sound echoed across the valley. Papa must have fired at something, thought Mary Ann. But the monsters just blinked and thought for a second and then ignored the sound. The mother monster was itchy. She scratched her back with her hind foot, then trundled down to the sand and wriggled into it as though to say, ah, that's nice and scratchy. The baby monster sniffed at Mary Ann's foot. It must be a pretty smelly foot, thought Mary Ann, but the baby monster didn't seem to mind. It butted her again, just as the mother monster stood up, the gleaming sand falling off her and shining in the sunlight. Ah, fine fat duck, yelled Papa through the trees, just sitting there, waiting for our dinner. The monster mother froze. The baby monster dashed over to her, then suddenly they were gone, racing surprisingly quickly through the trees. What's so funny? Papa threw the duck down onto the ground, then sat down to pluck it. There was a baby animal and its mother too, all brown and furry. Oh, that'd be native badgers, said Papa. And there's another note at the bottom to say wombats. There's some that live in trees and eat gum, gum leaves. Another couple of asterisks and it says koalas. And some that live in holes and eat grass. These ain't grass. The baby one sniffed my foot and the big one rolled in the sand and came up all sparkling like someone had dusted it with gold. And then, Marianne stopped. What is it, Papa? Gold, said Papa slowly. It rolled in the sand and came out covered in gold. Not covered, just sort of sparkly and Papa leapt to his feet. He rummaged in the packs and came up with a tin plate and carried it down to the sand. Mary Ann ran after him. He shoved a handful of sand onto the plate and dipped it in the water. He rolled the plate back and forth so most of the sand splashed out with the water. There, said Papa softly. Look at that, darling. Mary Ann looked. There at the bottom of the dish, among the dull white sand, were shiny flakes of... Gold, whispered da Dad, Papa, sorry. Gold! Suddenly he leapt to his feet. Gold, he yelled. You found us gold! He swept Mary Ann off her feet and swung her round and round. Gold, gold, gold! We'll pan ourselves a bucket full before we tell anyone. Then we'll find James and make a claim and... Mary Ann tried to catch her breath. What was gold? Just glittery grains in the sand? But gold made you rich. It gave you a proper house and fruit trees and somewhere in the shadows, the native badgers seemed to grin at her through the trees. And that's the end of the chapter. So what we'd like you to do now is to show us the questions that you came up with as I was reading Valley of Gold. But then we'd like you to choose your own book uh, and to start reading maybe for 20 minutes or so. But as you do, to really try and focus in on that skill of questioning as you read. You don't need to write down the questions for your own book, but we do want you to be thinking about them. 
so that you are practicing this skill and making yourself a better reader. Enjoy.